See, this is where so you don't, you this is why I want you to change your picture, your paradigm. Where you I want the paradigm to shift, but you gotta kind of see how. Now for her, it's be it's beginning to move. It's beginning. I think first she had to have received the personal revelation of what was the next like what she could do differently. Yes! And then she did it with intent. Then when they were quiet, I went and found them. That's thinking, that's creating intention and acting on it where you're in charge of the plan. You're you're doing it rather than letting things happen and you react to it. That's intentional parenting. That's what it looks like. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I don't even know if you realize that's what what that is, but that's the beginning steps of real intentional parenting. It feels different when you do that. Yes, it does. Like, it's like I'm more fulfilled as a parent when I parent that way than stop doing that. Stop hitting your brother. Stop. Yes, that's a hopeless feeling because how many times have I said that? <laughs> now, as a as the product of intentional parenting, what did you say your daughter is doing? She's She's doing more to be helpful. Right. Why? It is. When we intentionally parent, we help them see that they can be in charge of their behavior, and they could choose to do those things which make us happy, which make them happy. You see the power that comes from intentional parenting. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, please. I ask questions. I have a three-year-old little boy, and this was very entertaining to listen to his responses. And then it just, it just didn't stop after one minute. I conversations for 10 or 15 or 20 minutes about just the funniest little things, and it's so enjoyable for both my husband and I in the car to get and ask questions and You know, because he would say, oh, daddy, you're the green monster. And my husband's like, well, I want to be the red monster. And he, my son would just fight back and forth like, no, daddy, you're the green monster. So we just had some fun conversations, and it was very entertaining with him last week just to get to see him talk more and his use his imagination now, too. So what, what, how old was the child? Three. Three. Most of the time when we look at these principles, we think about school-age children. That, you know, when they're old enough to reason, when they're old enough to sit down and have a discussion with, when they're old enough. But the key is laying the foundation before. She's laying the foundation right now for connection. Do you see how much fun that three-year-old has in, let's play monsters and <coughs> next time be the polka-dotted monster and see if that'll throw him off, you know, and this, this this playing with them and talking with them and interacting with them, that's creating <coughs> connection, which is creating that safety. So now, when she wants to teach him, and he's 15, a gospel principle, but that connection has been laid, will he listen? Yes. Yes, because the attachment and the connection's there. That's what, that's fabulous. And it's kind of fun to do. It really is fun. And you do it not in punishment, not when they're misbehaving. It's when you are creating it in their good space. That's what, and then when they are misbehaving, they allow us to teach them. This is what allows us to be able to teach them when they misbehave. Anyone else? Yes, please. Um, I would just be asking questions too, but I was focusing more on asking questions before uh, jumping on her <laughs> for being hurt. My three-year-old is um, she gets really honored, really whiny, and so before um, before just getting frustrated with her, I would ask her some questions to. Um, and it seemed to help her to calm down too, and just change the way she was talking, and help me and her to be able to have a conversation instead of just getting frustrated with each other the whole time. 
Exactly, 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 exactly right. Yes. So I took this class last year, and up until that point, my five-year-old and I, we butt heads like so, so bad. And he was only five, and so I was very worried for what was to come. But this whole idea of like asking questions and attachment completely has transformed our relationship this past year. And um, I feel like before I, I remember coming to your class and being like, wait, why is she not talking about discipline the first week? Like, that's what I need. And it was so interesting this last year to see how when I'm attached to him and interested in what he's saying and asking him questions, how I didn't have to discipline as much because he wanted to please me because he knew I was on his side. So it 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 works. It really does. It's it's been amazing to see that transformation. It's so awesome. It is so awesome. But you you do have to practice it for a time. Number one, some of your some of your kids are already preconditioned to respond to one word answers. And most of that's because number one, they don't have the attachment, and number two, they don't feel safe. And so any prolonged conversations are usually your lecture series, and they really don't want to go there. So they'll give you the one word answer. And, and so we have to change what we do and then allow them time to understand that, that it's safe for them to open up. They won't just open up if, they, if you haven't already established that pattern. So if you come back to me next week and say, I tried that question thing and it just doesn't work. This child is way closed and will not open. And they even get a little sassy when I keep asking questions. Two things are happening. One is they're not trusting this change in you. And number two, you may need to pray for inspiration on how to ask better questions that they don't feel attacked. Because we'll say, well, I was asking a question and your tone of voice is just like that. So, I, so what did you do? And I say, that's a good question. It's not a yes or no. But I'm, well, they're going to be backing right off saying, you know, I'm not telling you what I did because I don't want you to know. And it may be a perfectly good thing that they did. But that approach, your tone of voice, as well as the verbiage that you use, sends a message. Let me just throw, just half, half a second. My memory's bad. I'll forget, but you won't. So whenever we do something wrong, and I'm talking about you or them, the brain is wired that we automatically go into a fight or flight mentality. That's where the brain will go. So you think about if your husband or somebody comes in and attacks you for some, how come you didn't get the garage clean today? You said you were gonna clean the garage. Your immediate response is that Fight or flight, it's either, forget it, I don't, I'm not talking about this, or it's, what do you expect? I've had kids, you know, you're either gonna fight or you're gonna flight. So our children are the same way. And sometimes we don't act any more adult than they do. Only we have a bigger body, so we feel like we have a right to do what we do. But, the three questions diffuses flight and, and fight. So it allows them to get composure back so you can talk. So if you ask those three questions, it helps diffuse the automatic response when they feel attacked. I was just going to say, I found also that sometimes there are times when your child just doesn't want to answer questions. Like, I'll try to ask my son questions right off the bus, and he's like, Mom, I want to talk, but not right now. I yes! Yes! So, I mean, I feel like sometimes you just don't maybe ask questions at the right time. Right! And then secondly, I want to say we made a mission statement like two years ago when I took the class. So I used this as an opportunity to kind of refresh and update what we've done. Did you bring it? I did. Oh, would you share it? Sure. It's still a work, work in progress. But See, the two years and it's still in progress? That's okay. Um, That's all right. This is it right now. To enjoy harmony, unity, joy, and teamwork in our family, striving to return to our heavenly home together, 
We the thorn go on adventures together, serve others, work together, do hard things, are kind, get back up when we fall, have grateful hearts, pray together, go to church together, read scriptures together, make good choices, love and respect others, and never give up. I love that. That is awesome. Now, do you have a family motto we that do. you do? What's it? It's imagine, believe, achieve. See how good that is? I love it. See how, what you want, how you're going to get there, and then the motto is just a real quick reminder, the every day, that you can say as they go out the door. That is awesome. Okay, there was another hand. Yes, please. I, so my daughter and I were, <clears throat> and I don't know if she enjoys it, but she loves to argue. Oh, yes. And I don't, like this morning, she wanted to make, I made breakfast, I made scrambled eggs, and she apparently wanted to make her own scrambled eggs. I mean, because of time, there wasn't, you know, she can, you know, she had to get to school, and so she, I'm like, this is what I have, you know, you can eat it or not, and she just kept on saying, well, you know that I like to make my own, you know this, and you know this, and why don't you, and I'm like, I'm sorry, just, it is what it is right now, we ran out of time, you know, I'm sorry, next time, and she kept on, and kept on saying it, and just some words, Ah. <laughs> okay, we're really going to cover this, but let me just give you the cliff notes okay. real quick. You talk too much. <laughs> I talk too much. <laughs> Explaining why? Now let me let's let's go back. That was a rude comment from my part, but it got your attention, didn't it? <laughs> so now I don't even like talking. <laughs> but she cannot engage unless you engage. Mm -hmm. So she says it the first time, and you can say, I'm sorry, sweetheart, I forgot today, or you can do it tomorrow, or we're really under a, a time crunch today, and I feel really bad that you're upset. I have, I, for me, I make it a point to only say it twice. Once, to let them know that this is how it is. The right. second time, they may not have heard it because they're in their mind just Very good. to themselves. Uh -huh. And then the third time, I don't say anything. Okay, but then the question is, what do you do? I do nothing. No, but you, there's something going on. I eat my breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the reason that I say this is, even if you quit talking, what you're doing can be shouting. So if you're just, if you're eating, just eating your breakfast, but it's with that withdrawn, walls up thing about, I told you so, I'm not talking about this anymore, which they feel, or whether it's a sweet, where you can smile at them and oh, even touch okay. them. So you haven't withdrawn from them, but you have withdrawn from the conversation. There's a difference between withdrawing from them and withdrawing from the conversation. So you're just withdrawing from the conversation is a good thing. And, and we'll talk about, these are called power struggles, and we'll talk about them in some pretty good depth when we get to discipline, because, and the reason that she always, these power struggler people are, uh, are children who feel like the only time they are of importance is when they're in control. And when they're not in control, they feel less valuable. So they're always after power and control. So there's a way to give them that on your terms, I just told her rather on their demand. To grow up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we'll help you get through some of those. Give you a few more ideas. You know, you just need a few more ideas, a few more tools. But uh, good job. You know, we tend to continue to engage, 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 whether it's verbally or body, and that's where those become very interesting experiences. <coughs> Okay, anyone else like to share? I love this, yes. So when we were talking last week and we were talking about creating a vision and motto and, and all those things, that was really stressing me out, which told me that I needed to work on that. And so I was don't thinking you love about, it? no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, like after. Um, and so like the first like half of the week and I was just thinking about it and it was just frustrating me because I couldn't think of any like example, I could like I don't. My family just like it just wasn't. I couldn't <clears throat> think of any examples of. And I I like learn best interactively and like when I can see what's going on. And so I couldn't. It was really difficult for me to 
really create kind of that vision. And there are a lot of other things going on too that were stressing me out. But then on Sundays, if there were a few things that happened that just really cleared my mind and I was able to think clearly and it was just so nice to be, and all my jumbled thoughts kind of just kind of cleared out and I just wrote it all down and I have this big giant paper of things that, that's disorganized and then my husband and I were able to have a conversation and about what types of characteristics or or values that we wanted to be a core part of our family and it just created a great discussion that lasted for way too long because I was falling asleep. <laughs> and just because it was late at night, that's the only time we can really talk with the kids and everything. But it was it was just a breath of fresh air, a breath of hope and kind of moving forward after a long period of okay. Can I give you personally a homework yes. assignment? Yes. What is my personal homework I'm glad you got your pen out. Good girl. I want you to write in your journal that experience. Because I'm going to give you another homework assignment a little bit later that I want you to share it with your children. Okay? So you need to record it so you have it when the time is right for you to share it. Okay? Okay? Because that right there is a fabulous experience that we tend to not realize its value. And we're going to make that application today in today's class. And so you have just brought in the perfect, I want to perfect that example. You. you are so kind. <laughs> you are so kind. So for your family, this will be a fabulous a teaching tool for you to be able to share here in a little while. Great. Anyone else want to go before we go? <laughs> she yes, just please basically drink. told my exact story for the week. <laughs> well, I already had, like from last class, yes. a bunch of thoughts down for our mission statement and values and blah, blah, blah. But I, the organization of it was really stressing me out. And all week I thought about it because you told me I needed to get it. Anyway, and so come Sunday, same thing. I just had this, like, everything cleared. And I sat down, and all afternoon, I wrote and wrote and wrote, and then I started typing. And then I even, my husband sat down with me Sunday evening after we put the kids to bed, and he'd say, you know, I think, let's edit this. I'd really like to see this. In this talk, it focuses on six points. Could we include this and this? And it was just, and then my sister-in-law is this beautiful art, artistic, so she's making a, a thing for our wall, and... Anyway, it was just, and like she said, there was this, not a wait, like, I have to do this, but more like, we did this, like, um, and on a spiritual level, not like a, like a homework assignment for right, school, right, right. where you're like, oh, you know, like, it was just like, I cannot wait to put this up on our wall and for our children, and mine, I'm one of those people who can't simplify. I like I heard yours, and I was like, oh, I, mine just I can go on and on. And so Jared was helping me cut it down. And anyway, but it's it's really um, a very fulfilling task. Done. Okay, Bryn, can I raise one sentence in your comment? You raise one sentence. Mm -hmm. Okay. To have done. This goes oh, on right. living. This yeah, has so life. This will Jared go on forever. Too. And I said, could it extend? He said, well, don't you think we'll be editing it? Like, as our kids get older? And I was like, no, we're done. You know? And, <laughs> and, he, said, and he said, I, I'm sure we'll want to add, you know, as more revelation comes from our prophet and things like that. So, anyway. That answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But also, the difference between intentional parenting and reactive parenting one of the differences is that when I invite you to do homework, it's not an assignment check off the list like a school. Okay, I got my math done. Okay, you know, this is done. Okay, this is done. These are invitations to life changing experiences. So if you get it, and I'm not talking about you, Bryn, but if you get it done and hang it on your wall, and you think, Whew. okay, that one's done. Uh, you're not done. It's like getting your Come Follow Me book at church and putting it on your shelf and never opening it. You've got it on the wall. 
But if you never <laughs> teach to it, it won't bond and empower your family. Part of creating it creates the beginning of that bond, but it's teaching to it and using it. What you want this to become is, if you will, a mirror for your family to be looking in daily to see who they are. You want it to be their mirror. It has to be their focus, which means they need to be looking in it or you referring to it or you're bringing it to a conscious level, level intentionally regularly. Does that make sense? That's why it's so fun to have uh, the little cheer or whatever that you can say right at the end of your family prayer because that brings it in. And then to have a home evening lesson, I know you're doing a Come Follow Me. We'll talk about incorporating Come Follow Me and home evening lessons and family activities. All, you know, you kind of go, Ugh. but it's not. It's fabulous. We have to know how to invigorate it so it's not overwhelming. But all of those things. And so as you have those activities, you actually do it. So one of your things is that we work together. We say, okay, in our mission statement, we said we work together. So today we get to go out and clean the yard. And they go, but they're saying, we agreed that this is us. And so we go out and do it. Do you see, you can say, let's go out and rake the leaves in the yard. Or you can say, hey, in our mission statement, we said this is us. So this is what we're going to go do. Do you see how you pull it in, in little ways? You, you probably are living it, but you got to connect the dots for kids. They don't connect their own dots. You have to connect the dots. And that's what we're going to talk about today is connecting dots. So um, anyone else? Yes, please. I just have a comment. Mine wasn't really about my mission statement. That's okay. But, um, my five-year-old woke up this morning and grabbed something off the internet. Having a bad day, like, you know, I don't know if she woke up on her own I don't really know what was wrong, but my husband was like, oh my gosh, like, I need a tantrum. And I just said to him, and then, I don't even know, like, maybe it was for me too, as much as it was for him, but I'm like, she's having a bad day. Like, you have bad days. Like, we all have bad days. She's allowed to have a bad day where she just wants to be in her room with the door closed or whatever it is. And you can't make her change that like if she's just having a bad day and for me it was just to think like oh like i have bad days where i'm just grouchy just leave me alone you know and it's all right for them to have it as well and i don't you know maybe i voiced it for him as much as it was for me but it was just kind of like oh that's right you know very good very good and you are the perfect bridge into today so fabulous thank you thank you thank you thank you for sharing Okay, so today I want to share with you two things, and then I want you to tell me how they correlate to intentional parenting. Okay, and then I uh, then we'll talk about it. The first one is a quote that was given in the talk that President Nelson gave when he was first called when first sustained him as a prophet, and I'm sure all of you remember. This talk, when I, I mean, when I gave you this quote, you'll remember it. Now, he said, now we're talking, You, I want you to listen, not for you, I want you to listen for parenting. <laughs> Listening as, it, as this applies to parenting, these two quotes. And so this is what he said. In coming days, it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. If we are to have any hope of sifting through the myriad of voices and the philosophies of men that attack truth, we must learn to receive revelation. And then further in that talk, he's, he used these words, I urge, I plead, I exhort you to choose to do the spiritual work required to enjoy the gift of the Holy Ghost and hear the voice of the Spirit more frequently and more clearly. If you want to know, that was in April Conference of 2018. I think it's receiving revelation for the church and for, anyway. So that's one quote. 
The second quote I want to share with you is in regards to the new youth program, which we will all be watching a video on, on September 29th, all over the church, everybody in the church uh, will meet together in their second hour and watch this video, it's 48 minutes long, presented by the prophet and several of the other of the apostles. And in introducing lightly the, the you know, the, what is it, the trailer for the new youth program, this is how he described it. Connect this to that first quote and then tell me what you think. So this is what he said. Instead of giving you many specific assignments, we are inviting you to counsel with the Lord about how you can grow in a balanced way. He's talking to the youth. It will be rewarding and fun, but it will also take some effort on your part. You will need to seek personal revelation. You will need to choose for yourself how to act on it. Sometimes the Spirit may prompt you to do things that are difficult. I think you are up to the challenge. You can do hard things. How do these two connect to parenting? Intentional parenting. Okay, so this probably isn't what you're going for at all. I'm not for anything. I'm just want to know your thoughts. I was just, it made me think about how all kids are different and, yeah. um, we can read like all the parenting books we want and get all the tips that we want, but really like we and Heavenly Father know our kids the best. And so by praying about what to do and receiving revelation for our specific kids and, um, you know, using our own intuition, I think that we, we can best figure out how to meet the specific needs of our own kids. Very, very well said. Very good. Anyone else? Yes, please. My, uh, I have kids ranging from 14 to 6, and they each, of course, are having their own different struggles in school. And I guess for me, when I heard his talk about the importance of personal revelation, like it hit me super hard. Of, yeah. My kids aren't going to be able to survive through the day in school unless I teach them how to be able to do it for themselves. You know what I mean? How are they going to deal with people bullying them for who they are? unless they can feel Christ walking with them and know who to turn to and be able to get that for themselves. And so I don't know. I guess that's been a theme for me is just like, how do I help them connect in? Because they need it to survive. Very good. Very good. Anyone else make any connections between those two? Please. Um, something I don't like to hear, but... Parents do a lot of work, and we can't just sit around. We can't sit around and fly through it all. We have to push through the work. And I, I mean, I've even felt a lot of difference just in the last five years of how much I have to feed my spirit in order to combat everything around me. And if I slide and don't for a few days, it's like you feel it. Mm -hmm. You feel those influences seeping in, like ever so slowly, but they seep in. And if you sit back and notice. Um, how much it affects you, and it has to be intentional. We have to be fighting it every single day, and it's scary, and it's terrifying, but if you give us that power, it's there if we just look for it. That's, that's exactly right. Yes? Um, just over the past few years, I feel more of an urgency to um, be, to strengthen my testimony. Because I feel like, especially with having children, like I don't want them to, I don't want them to ever feel that, like, in, like that they're in a secure place. And I feel like me and my husband having like, you know, a firm foundation that they can um, just know that that we there's where we stand essentially. Because I feel like, um, you know. When you're growing up, you don't really have your own testimony. You kind of rely on, you know, your parents, and which I'm grateful to my parents. And so I feel, but I feel more of an urgency to make sure that I am doing what I'm supposed to be doing, um, because I feel like um, it can only strengthen my family when the time. I feel like at this point, the time 
are you know are getting harder and making you know poor choices and stuff. I you know if they can by example I guess to make better choices even than I made. Yeah. Very very well very well said. We usually hear President Nelson's talk in relation to us. You know, what do I need to do? What do I need to be focused on? What do I need to be? But I want you to listen to conference this time in, in the mode of parenting. Now, last week we talked a little bit about what this I generation is looking like. And what your kids are dealing with. And just like Nephi, when he built his ship, uh, if you remember in the scriptures, it says he did not build it after the manner of men. We have got to build our families not after the manner of men. And the Lord is giving us the blueprint of how to do it. But it's not after the manner of men. After the manner of men is going to get them all tangled up in this I generation. And we are going to have to do different things to pull them out. Now, I there's a very good article that some of you may want to look up. Uh, it's in LDS Living. If any of you get that or you know are involved with that, it's called Five Things Church Members Need to Know About, and they call it Generation Z. But this is this lady that wrote the book called it the I Generation. The, this article is calling it Generation Z. And so it's five things that church members or parents ought to know about this upcoming generation. And these are reactions from the youth, what they're trying to tell us. Now remember, there's a difference between when you were raised and what they're going through, even though it's one generation. So when we parent the way we were parented, because that's all we know, it, it probably is not going to work it, for your children. And so we need to come to have an understanding of where they are. And they're not being bad, but we need to understand who they are so we can not lower our standards of parenting, we still have to parent and we still have to set boundaries, but do it in a way that it connects with them. Does that make sense? So a couple of the things that they said in this, the five things, and I'll just tell you what they are, though we're not going to go into them in detail, is they want parents to know and adults to know that they learn differently. They don't learn by lecture. You learned, we learned, I learned by the lecture series, whether it was at school or whether it was at church or whether it was discipline, it was the lecture series. And we tend to think that when we are lecturing our children, we're teaching them, but they don't learn that way. Okay? Uh, they learn, they rely heavily on technology. How many of your children know where Siri is? <laughs> and you know where the internet is and ask google and that this is kind of how they learn it's important for you to know that and understand that because now today we're going to talk about teaching them to receive the promptings of the holy ghost so we're fortifying them with this quote from president nelson but if they expect the holy ghost to be siri then this we teach them that you kneel down and pray and the Holy Ghost will give you the answer to your prayers. And they see that in their head. Their experience says it's Siri. So um, I was reading a book the other day and uh, I can't remember if it was Sherry Dew or Wendy Watson anyway. Their nephew, I think it was Wendy before she was married to the prophet. Uh, her little nephew said, you know, do you want to be married? And she says, well, you know, I just haven't met the right person or whatever yet. And he says, well, just go pray and ask Heavenly Father and he'll just, he'll just give you a husband. Well, in our <laughs> desire to teach children that prayers are answered, we, we may be teaching them a wrong concept because of how they learn. You know, it's not because you're, it's how they, how they perceive 
where they're coming from. So it's important to know what they are. The second thing is, the article said, is that they have blurred lines between work, life, and church. For them, it all blends together. I remember in my earlier, well, not well, probably when you were about the time you were being born, but when I, mean, I was grown, I had children and remembered the concept of becoming, uh, this was when the internet, the internet had become commercialized, uh, the concept of people working from home. That was so hard for me to wrap my head around. You had a job and you got up in the morning and you went to work. And the, the concept of people just working from home, that was hard for me to, to understand. And now you go to school at home and you work at home and you, you do everything. You do everything from home. And so their world is, there are not these defined lines. Do you see why it's, it's so critically important to have a home centered gospel because it's they they and it was wrong before where you'd say okay we live at home and then we go to church and do church this has to be part of who they are all the time is that because they have kind of a one image and it, it there's no distinct lines and so i thought that was very interesting the other thing is Number three was that uh, addictions and temptations are shifting. It used to be the drugs and, you know, the smoking and the drinking and the sex. Those things are shifting. Those addictions are going actually going down, according to all the surveys. But the addiction to media is going up. So the addictions are changing, and we need to know what they are. So when we tell, teach our children to don't do drugs, they say, okay, you know, oh, I won't do drugs. But they're still addicted. We have to teach our children not to have addictive behavior. And so number four is this generation, and they acknowledge that they're more depressed and anxious than other generations. And we need to, and, and you know the church is dealing with that. They have websites for that. They've allowed missionaries to call home once a week. They're, they're trying to work towards that. There is no quick answer, but there are definitely things that we can do with intentionally intentional parents to fortify our children against that. But we have to teach to that, train to that. And number five was they value trust and authenticity. And so they really value connected relationships. They're heroes now in your day. Well, I can't speak for your day, I don't know. In my day, it was your uh, movie stars were the heroes. And then I think it went to like sports um, athletes became heroes or music personnel became heroes, role models for the youth and now interestingly it's more bloggers they identify more with instagram or bloggers as their role models and their heroes and they see them as more authentic and so that is why it's critical that we create connection and attachment with our children that then we become the authentic source we become who they listen to for self-image, for uh, spiritual growth, and for those things that um, will, will help them develop a path that they want to be on. So these things are important to understand. Now, with that being said, the key shield that you can give your children is just what President Nelson said that if you can teach them to hear, understand, and live by the promptings of the Holy Ghost, they will be fortified. They will be given, through the Holy Ghost, they will be given the power, because it's a gift of the Holy Ghost, to discern which of all of this gunk out there is truth, and which of this is the philosophies of the great and spacious building. Where because everything kind of blends together, 
as they receive it, sometimes they don't know where what where the defining lines are. Do you remember last week when I shared the this generation? One of the things was they don't know they don't know the standards of morality. They're, they're confused about those standards. Well, that's because all of this is just si kind of like a mist that just all flows together, and they don't know what's right. So. First of all, we have to create the connection. We create it to us when they're little, then we transfer that connection to Heavenly Father. If they're never connected to us, they have a very difficult time just connecting to a Father in Heaven because they don't understand what love, acceptance, forgiveness feels like. We tell them that Heavenly Father forgives sins, and then they look at us, and we're always on them about everything they do wrong, and they say, no, he only loves me if I do everything right. Because that's what they're experiencing. So we have to intentionally parent them to have experiences to connect with us so that we can teach them about what the Holy Ghost and Heavenly Father's love feels like. So there is a process, and we're going to go over that today. And it starts when they're teeny. It starts with your five-year-old or younger. The, the Holy Ghost is given to our children when? The gift of the Holy Ghost. When they're baptized, when they're eight years old. They need to have been prepared to receive it before that. And being prepared to receive it means more than just teaching them that the Holy Ghost will tell you what's right or wrong, or the Holy Ghost will be a comfort to you when you have, you know, hard times or when you're afraid, or the Holy Ghost will help you find things that are lost if you say your prayers. And we tend to teach the Holy Ghost after that manner. And it has to be more than that. That is teaching them knowledge, if you will, but knowledge will not teach them, like he says, to do the spiritual work required to enjoy the gift. That, that teaches them knowledge, but it doesn't teach them how to enjoy the gift. And sometimes I wonder if we enjoy the gift. And so that's exactly what I taught over at BYU-Idaho this week, at, this last summer at Education Week, was how do we... How do we enjoy the, us as adults, enjoy the gift of the Holy Ghost? When we are eight and we receive the gift, the verb used is receive. receive. And that is a command. That is a to-do. That isn't, here's a present and it's just yours. It is, you now have the right to turn on the radio, get the static out, tune it up, so that you can have a clear connection. But that has to be done over and over and over and over and over. And I don't know that our children understand that. That it is something that they pray for daily to have that companionship. That they know how to recognize it when they have it when they know how to feel it when they don't have it. And that probably is more, would be, they would feel more when they don't have it than when they do have it. So the first part of teaching, and this is gonna seem a little, kind of flow with me here, because you're gonna kind of think, you gotta be kidding me? Are, are you changing topics? And I'm not changing topics. The, the Holy Ghost speaks to most of us, how? In feelings, or thoughts. We have inspiration. Most of us do not have visions, do not see angels, do not have a burning bush, and yet when we share these uh, experiences with our children in family home evening of you know, Moses in the burning bush and Joseph Smith seeing angels, and we talk about these dreams that, you know, um, Melvin J. Ballard had, and we talk about all these experiences, and their mind says, unless I see a burning bush, or unless I have a vision, or how do I know the Book of Mormon is true? No angel ever came to me. Do you see that even though we're, we're teaching them Holy Ghost, 
they're expecting the answer to be these marvelous, wonderful experiences that typically will not be, they may have, but typically will not be what they experience. And typically what they experience is feelings and thoughts. And they don't recognize them. So the first step in teaching children to learn to be cognizant of the Holy Ghost in their life is to teach them to recognize the value of feelings, of any feeling. We're talking about feelings. So we need to teach them. Children do not come into the world knowing how they feel. Their cognizant ability to uh, connect ideas is developing. It comes with their developing of words and communication. They, they, when a little baby is hungry, they cry. But they don't think, I'm hungry. I need my mother to come and feed me, I'm hungry. They just cry. When they are tired, they cry. They, they, they're not identifying feelings. And so as they grow older, if we're not teaching them, when they have a sibling take a toy, they smack them. They don't stop and say, I am frustrated, or I am angry, or I feel, they don't. They don't identify it. They react. They're, they're reacting. They're, they're reactive. And if we tend to give them a lot of what they want, they become selfish and entitled, and whenever they don't get what they want, then they react. So right from the beginning, as we've got these little tiny people starting to grow up, 18 months, moving on, we need to start training them and stop. I mean, of course, 18 month olders we're going to do a lot for because they still need that. But as they grow older and older and older, we need to train them to do more on their own and not be a helicopter mom so that they learn to deal with not having everything they want, frustration, anger, joy. They learn to identify these feelings. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen these in schools. You can print these off the computer. You can have these. And if you have little people, I'd recommend you do. And then have a family home evening lesson on feelings. And talk about there's nothing on this that's bad. There's nothing here that's bad. What's bad or good is what we do with these things. But we teach them to acknowledge all kinds of feelings. Now, why would that be teaching them how the Holy Ghost feels? I think sometimes it's also important to remember with the feelings is that rarely we feel one single emotion. It's typically multiple that we're feeling at one time, so we express one. Right. Um, and so I think that you have to be able to recognize that, yes, I'm anxious, nervous, you know, upset, whatever. All of this is going on, but what I'm showing is this. And I think that is also sometimes when there's a lot going on, how are you going to feel the Holy Ghost? If there's all these other emotions that you're feeling at one time. How can you focus on one? That's right. Strong emotions, undealt with, will um, make it so you can't hear the Holy Ghost. I love the quote from Elder Scott where he said, hearing the Holy Ghost is like uh, and having strong emotions when you have strong emotions and then you're trying and you're praying. So let's say, let's just say for instance, you might be really, really angry at your husband for something. And you're praying that you can handle your emotions. You know, please, Heavenly Father, help me to settle down. Help me to, you know, but you're praying and you're mad and you're angry. And he says, when we pray in that emotion, whether it's fear, whether it's anger, whether it's desperation, when we pray in that mode, it's like, uh, Elder Scott said, it's like eating, trying to distinguish the flavor of a grape when you're eating it with a jalapeno pepper. 
And so I love that because it's so, you can see it. So one of the things, obviously, that we were going to teach our children is all emotion is good, but what do we do with it? So let me give you an example. You have a child that says, let me tell it, teach, give you an example so you see how we tend to invalidate it. Um, you have a child that uh, is afraid at night, and they, they seem to consistently be afraid at night, and they seem to consistently come in and, and um, bug you. And you know it's, you, you, you know, you've gone through this. You've done this every single night, and you're just getting, you have a night, you're really tired, and they're screaming, and you go in there, oh, there's a monster under my bed, there's a monster under my bed. You've done this now many nights. And you say, what? There is no monster under your bed. What did you just do? Invalidated the right for them to have the feeling. You told them what they can or cannot feel. And we can't do that. So you have to, number one, always validate the right to have the feeling. If you have a child that's getting very angry and throwing a little temper tantrum, validate the feeling first. I can see that you're really angry. Maybe you need some time to cool down. And then we'll talk. You always validate their right to have a feeling. But then you're going to teach them what we're going to do with it. Megan? Well, and not only with children, but even just with adults. <laughs> <laughs> you need to validate their feelings, but then don't take that feeling upon yourself. Yes! Yes! Because that's not your feeling to own. It's theirs. That's right. People just want to be heard and recognized. And you can't help anybody if you seek to carry their burden. Right. You can only help somebody that walk beside and help them. If you take on their anger or their depression or their whatever, you do them a disservice. Jenny. So yesterday, during the week, it wasn't ideal. I didn't handle it the best I should, but I guess in a way. We call those learning experiences. Yeah. <laughs> I got lots to learn. I'm not a very patient woman, unfortunately. <laughs> I really am not. Um, but yesterday, um, I just had to get some stuff done for our Living Society activity I'm planning next week or next month. And I just couldn't do that home because at home we're we're in a very small area where it's five of us in this small area. So I uh, took them to Bobby and Motion, just a little area of my friends of mine where they like run around, play on the slide, whatever. So I was there while I was working on my laptop and all of a sudden I just hear my son scream. I look behind me and I see it's because some kid had taken a rope that he was just swinging in my closet. And he just comes, he's just screaming like this. And I'm like, oh dear. <laughs> Dad, come here. And he goes, Mommy, it's fine. I'm like, no. What did we talk about in the car? We share. Of course, I didn't probably handle it the best. Like, I didn't, I guess I didn't validate it. But I'm like, Dad, we share. Remember, we always share. It's not yours. It's for everybody. If you don't understand, if you can't do that, then we're going home. And he goes, okay, and he was just upset. But he leaves, and then I look back, and he's playing. I'm like, okay, think that one. <laughs> you know, but I just let him be, let him do his thing, let him figure it out, playing with these other little boys that he used to learn to socialize with. And then when we were leaving, there was one specific mom who was just playing with them. I just couldn't because I had a little one I had to keep an eye on. And I told him, like, Dad, can you tell her thank you for playing with you? And he did. And she said, he did really good after you talked to him, telling him he had to share it. After you talked to him, he was pulling out the rope and just going, here, your turn. And I'm like, <laughs> good, at least I didn't handle it well, but I got the message across. Oh, I think you handled it well, Jenny. I don't know. It's I'm teaching. Really it's not just it. yelling at, it's teaching. Just preface it next time with, I can see you're frustrated. But we need to learn to share. So validate the feeling. And then, see, that's the problem we have is so often in parenting, we quit, we quit parenting. We've got to parent through. That's the intentional parenting is parent through to the end. Parent through and, and teach them. So as, as you validate their right to have feelings and you're teaching about feelings, and then you teach them how to handle feelings. Now, in this process, what you need to teach them is that because feelings can come, and that's okay, but they can have control. They can choose to control their feelings, and they need to get away from the attitude of, he made me mad. 
we do that with our spouses. He made me so mad. He wouldn't No, I am choosing to be mad because I'm frustrated. I am choosing. And you can help them understand. And this is where the Holy Ghost is going to come in, is because through the power of the Holy Ghost, they can choose to not act on anger. They can choose not to be offended. They And should. But they don't know how to do that unless you teach them. They don't just get that. And you telling them that, having a home evening and saying, you can choose, will not, it won't go in any further. It will come unto, but it won't go into. So that's the beginning. But then you have to have, through experiences, help them. And you can only do it if there's already a connection. So I think sometimes as parents, um, we've been around the world a lot more and sometimes we can tend to get desensitized to things. I actually just came back from a trip. Um, I went with a family to Vegas. Um, we took five steps onto the strip and this eight-year-old boy who got baptized earlier this summer all of a sudden started acting out. He was punching his dad and his dad's like, what are you doing? Why are you punching me? And he's like, I'm hungry. And he couldn't figure out his emotions until we took five more steps. And he started calming down a little bit, but then he acted up all again. And this time he was like anxiously and like looking around until, and that's why I'm like, as parents, we might sometimes get desensitized, but if we can ensure that we are in tune with the spirit so we can figure out because he was seeing showgirls and the spirit left and he had no idea. Do I get angry? How do I show? And it was a great teaching moment for my family and my kids and this family of i mean we were out of there it was five minutes on the strip and we were gone and this kid cried for hours so going why do we come to sin city i never want to come here that was the most horrible feeling ever but it was a great teaching moment of the spirit left and um and yeah you didn't know like how to do you get angry do you get sad do you get frustrated i mean it comes in all forms of ways of what do you do but as parents we need to be yeah in, in tune with the spirit as well, so we can figure out what are our children going through and what are they feeling, because we do get sensitized to the world of, oh, they're just showgirls, or... No, right. right, right, and remember, in the Book of Mormon, when Nephi said, Laman and Lemuel were past feeling, and so we don't want to reach the point where they're past mm -hmm. feeling. We don't want to stuff their feelings or tell them their feelings are not uh, appropriate. We want to teach them how to handle feelings but because the holy ghost cannot be heard when you're emotionally distraught we have to teach them what to do with feelings so that they can keep feelings in a controlled the spirit controls the natural man where we're governed by principle and not emotion that's our goal now i'm going to give you some ideas about uh, teaching the holy ghost but i i also want you to know that you're going to do all this teaching, but don't expect them to internalize any of it <laughs> until they have an experience with it. And in this time where you're teaching and they, they have to go through and they have to have lots of experiences with it, you have to be, as part of your teaching, testifying to them of your small encounters with the Holy Ghost every day. That's what really, you teach the principle, then you bear witness, you bear your testimony, you show them how it's affected your life, then they have an experience, a, a difficult one or one that they need to deal with, you walk them through the steps of having the Holy Ghost and helping them to identify it. So, in teaching the Holy Ghost, they're going to learn that it's a burning bush or it's a vision or it's some great thing. You need to teach them. There are still adults in institute or teenagers in seminary classes that think if they don't cry during a testimony that they don't have the spirit. That's, that's wrong. Some people cry, some people don't. And they need to know that the Holy Ghost is not innately in tears. It can be in tears, but it isn't always in tears. Some of us teach that, 
or they hear in their lessons that the Holy Ghost is a burning. You just have this overpowering, burning feeling, and you just know. It may not be a burning. I love uh, Elder Oak's talk where he says, I have never had a caloric burning. I've never had the experience of being on fire. And so they say, when they're teenagers, they say, well, I don't know if it's true. Because I've never cried during a testimony. I've never had a caloric burning. Therefore, I've never had a witness. So you see, you've got to teach them what it feels like to have an experience with the Holy Ghost. And you have to teach them that the Holy Ghost is not Santa Claus. So that's why I'm saying you take that experience that you had and... The Holy Ghost is not, and you need to teach this, the Holy Ghost is not Siri. You don't take the question and you get this immediate answer before you're off your knees. The Holy Ghost will answer in his time. And sometimes the Lord leaves us to ponder and struggle and work things out. But if we continue to think on it and ponder on it and pray about it, the answer will come. But the growing takes place not in the answer, but in the struggle. And so that's what we need to teach our children. So as we teach this, we have experiences and we've testified to them. We bear witness. Then we've taught them that this is the procedure to receive the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And then when they have... Oh, somebody, I just don't have any friends at school. Or, you know, whatever their, their little problems are, they're big problems to them. A big test, whatever it is, they're anxious, they're afraid. This then, because you've taught them the pattern, then you implement the pattern with a real experience with them, and you go through it with them, and you do it with them. So here's the pattern. Number one, either for you or for them. You need to make the request in prayer. You need to make the request. You need to prepare your heart to receive an answer. And that comes in calming down. That comes in putting your heart in tune with receiving the spirit, which comes through reading the scriptures. It also, it you have to... In teaching your children to be able to receive the Holy Ghost, you have to teach children reverence. And reverence is not just sitting quietly in church, not making noise. Reverence means putting yourself in tune with spiritual things. And they have very, we find reverence in the temple. They don't go to the temple. Where are they finding what reverence feels like? It needs to be. But you need to create experiences in your home where that feeling is present. Most of your children, if you go into primary or you go into young women's or young men's, feel very, very uncomfortable with reverence. And if the if if a, 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 a real spiritual lesson has been is in the process, and the the spirit comes and is strong. And you're just kind of feeling it for a moment. Somebody in the class who's not used to it will crack a joke or make a comment or do something to break that spirit because they're not familiar with it. And we have to create experiences in our home that help them have moments of reverence. So as they're seeking answers, they feel comfortable with be still and know that I am God. Then they need to desire whatever it is in their heart. And this is where we teach children and ourselves to pray with real intent. And when we pray with real intent, it means I am praying to know what I need to do. I am not praying, Heavenly Father, a job list. So what... You ask a question. You take a question to the Lord, which is, what is my part? What do I need to do? How can I not, would you, 
fix this problem? Would you make them more patient? Would you, whatever. It's what can I do and then will you empower me to do it? Help me to be able to do it. And then you need to help your children understand if they're seeking an answer from the Lord, they need to do something in their life that shows the Lord they have real intent. So if you really want Heavenly Father to answer this and you want to be part of that answer, what are you willing to do to show him that you are listening and you really want to know? And maybe you'll read your scriptures better for a week. Maybe you'll ponder the sacrament. They need to find some commitment on their part. Now, this whole thing means that they're learning to listen, do the spiritual work that President Nelson talked about, so that they understand the Holy Ghost in its reception is not Siri. There is spiritual work to be done to be able to be worthy to receive the Holy Ghost. As they do this over and over, uh, President Nelson says you start living, and Joseph Smith, he was quoting Joseph Smith, but you start living in Revelation. That you, you just... You're so attuned to the Spirit, and you've prepared yourself to receive the Spirit so much that you just live with that constant revelation. So in helping them prepare for a, a, a spirit of reverence and to be able to receive the Holy Ghost, you must create an environment. And I'm going to give you two things that I think help. If you look in your syllabus, I think on page 24, and 25, you'll find lists. I'm just going to barely cover this, and I'm going to let you study it. <coughs> Number one is, and you will find that these are in the areas of focus for church members from Elder Bong. They have it up here on their thing. The Sabbath day, keeping the Sabbath day holy, that is not just another thing that they're asking us to do. That, in this day, is empowering. That's where we receive our power to come out of the world and to bring our children out of the world so that they can learn to discern the philosophies of the great and spacious building. It's keeping the Sabbath day holy all day. Giving us an extra hour on Sunday was not just so we would have an extra hour to curl our girls' hair. It's so that we could keep the Sabbath day with real intent. I want you to think about how you have done over the last nine months with Come Follow Me. We've had it since January. How are you doing with that? That is given with the intent to bring the spirit, to bring this spirit of revelation and of reception of the Holy Ghost into our home. There's a quote in that book somewhere that uh, I think it was H. I think it's uh, Elder Burton, maybe I don't know Bishop Burton, Bishop Burton that says uh, keeping the Sabbath day holy entitles you to the revelations of the Holy Ghost. And so, just living that. What you do if you really keep the Sabbath day, you're making that day totally different than the rest of the days of the week. So that you're helping them learn to put the Lord above <coughs> the world. But if you don't make that day different, then we're just living in the world all the time. We have to come out of the world. That's, the, that's our children's temple, if you will. You bring them out of the world for the Sabbath day. Does it mean you sit them on the couch and say, okay... You're going to be reverent now for the rest of the day. And the answer is no. They should delight in the Sabbath day. Watch family videos. They love to see themselves. Go through scrapbooks. Have a good, wonderful, happy family bonding time. But also disperse it with come follow me and testimonies. Because their hearts are softer then. You're creating connection. And that's where they can be touched. The other one is, and I invite you to look at this this week, part of your homework is 
What do you do in your family to make conference special? How do you include your children in conference preparations? How do you make it so exciting that those are their favorite two Saturdays and Sundays of the year? That's homework. So I want you to write that down. And next week, I want to share ideas, your ideas, about what you do to make conference for little people, for teenage people, for yourself. What do you do to make conference exciting and special? Number two, homework. Your conference talk this week is, and we're talking about the Sabbath day, this is Elder Holland's talk, Behold the Lamb of God. April of 19, this last conference. Behold the Lamb of God, Elder Holland. And then I want you to evaluate that talk against your Sundays. Not for guilt, but for learning purposes. What can you do? What, what could you come away with that talk as one to do? One to do. Don't want you to read the whole talk and go, I quit. I'm not going to church anymore. <laughs> so one to do. So conference and the Sabbath. And then I'm going to ask you to do something difficult. Don't I always do that? So this is your opportunity to grow. This is really it. This is the one that you, you want. Um, I want you to um, write your testimony. I want you to write your testimony down. Uh, if you'll notice in the syllabus, I've written mine. Um, my mother left hers to all of my children. It was an open letter to her grandchildren, and she wrote her testimony. I want you to write your testimony. If you have grown children, I think it would be wonderful if you could share them. And if you don't have grown children, then um, I still want you to write it, because it, there's a a wonderful growing experience that just comes from writing them. And then number three. You're going to go, oh, how many more do I have to add? Um, I want you to, if you choose, it's going on right this very minute, so obviously you're not going to watch it live, but BYU Devotional, uh, President Nelson is speaking at BYU Devotional right now. Well, in three minutes, he will be. <laughs> Uh, and it will be uh, rebroadcast on LDS.org. So if you go to the church website, I mean the Church of Jesus Christ .org, the new, you know, just the site, it will be broadcast. You, you can go back and watch it even after it's over. He's speaking to the youth. He's speaking to college kids. What he wants you to do is listen with the heart of an intentional parent. So if he's telling college students what he wants them to do to join the Lord's Battalion, then I want you to say in your mind, what do I need to do to prepare my children so that they can accomplish what the prophet has asked them to do? And then I want to come together and share our battle plan. What will we do? Can you share that? Say that one more time, that question that was just asked. What do I need to do to teach? What do I need to do to help my children follow what the prophet's asking them to do? I have to prepare them to do this. What can I do, remember, not to make them do? What can I do to help them to want to choose to do what the prophet has asked? And, and I want to share those ideas together so that I'll listen to it too. And so we'll come together and see, see what we can, can come. I have two quotes I want to share with you in closing. Number one is from Elder Holland. This was given in April conference of 2003. If you want to look it up, it's on page 87. And he says, 
Now remember, we're teaching Holy Ghost and connection and intentional parenting. So with, under those three focuses, listen to this quote. Nephite-like, might we ask ourselves what our children know from us personally? Do our children know that we love the scriptures so they see us reading them and marking them and clinging to them in daily life? Have our children ever unexpectedly opened a closed door and found us on our knees in prayer? Have they heard us not only pray with them, but also pray for them out of nothing more than sheer parental love? Do our children know we believe in fasting as something more than an obligation on the first Sunday of the month? Do they know that we have fasted for them and for their future on days which they knew nothing about? Do they know we love being in the temple, not least because it provides a bond to them that neither death nor the legions of hell can break? Do they know we love and sustain local and general leaders, imperfect as they are, for their willingness to accept callings they did not seek in order to preserve a standard of righteousness they did not create? Do those children know that we love God with all our heart and that we long to see the face and fall at the feet of his only begotten son? I pray that they know this. Live the gospel as conspicuously as you can. Keep the covenants your children know you have made. Give priesthood blessings and bear your testimony. Don't just assume your children will somehow get the drift of your beliefs on their own. I love that. And the, the, the final story is from uh, President Nelson. And it's recorded in a booklet that they put out at, at Mother's Day that was just called Motherhood. And he wrote it when he was still Elder Nelson. He shares the experience of a mother who did not have much money. Each birthday, she would hand make a small gift for her child. Then she would take that child into her room and kneel in prayer together. She would tell Heavenly Father her love for that child and of all the special, unique gifts that child possessed and how grateful she was for being able to be the mother. What a wonderful experience with the spirit that special mother gave her children each year on her birthdays. I challenge you to give your children that special experience. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, how grateful we are to be here this morning and to feel the spirit that has been here. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be mothers in these latter days and grateful for the challenges as well as victories that we have along the way. We're grateful that we can have the spirit with us as we do the small and simple things and live our lives appropriately and strive to stay close to thee. We're grateful for the knowledge that we have of the gospel that we can be aided as we go, that we need never do any of this alone. Thank thee, Heavenly Father, for, for giving us the gift of the Holy Ghost and for personal revelation that we might know what each of our children need individually. Please help us to, to try a little harder to be a little better and to act on the impressions that we have felt today and know what we need to do individually so that we might accomplish those things, so that we might prepare our families for eternal life and returning home to live with thee. Heavenly Father, we are thankful with all of our hearts for Sister Tanner and her sacrifice for us, what she does for us, and the way this class impacts and touches our lives. And please bless us that we can see ourselves the way thou sees us. And we do love thee and we save thee soon. In Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. amen.